I guess we should still recap. That what do we? Oh, now you are back. Okay, <laughs> I'm confused. So, okay, so we will go to the fermion summarizing our Feynman rules. Second thing today is I just have one more little thing to say. Then we can summarize all the Feynman rules. So we're just. Recap what we did yesterday. <coughs> what we did yesterday is we tried to quantize EM field covariantly for no apparent purpose except uh, it's mathematically cute. And then we realized, of course, we have to impose the gauge condition somehow. And there is this Gupta Voipa condition is basically the best thing we can do, because the better things than that is impossible. But the most important result from that is we got the photon propagator. Which is basically your, sorry, I think I read a mess term yesterday. It's, it's the, Scalar propagator that you are familiar with, except now that it has this metric. Because the photon propagator, after all, is the time order of two photons. And if this definition has index, your result should have an index. Yeah? This is the momentum space. It's just like, I mean, that's all we tried yesterday, is try to utilize Klein -Gordon, what we learned from Klein-Gordon theory as much as possible, such that we can write down a propagator in one line, because you say, well, it's for Klein-Gordon theory, so the only thing we, we're missing is some tensor index to match with the propagator. So, well, we said, and we also see that how we can define physics states. I guess I should write down this condition. So it is says that you split it into the minus and the plus, and the annihilation, the one has annihilation operator, will annihilate the physics state, and the other half will be annihilated by the other half. So this is the known as the Gupta Bloya condition. Yeah, so now we have photon quantized. Remember last time we finally quantized the fermions, we immediately say now we have fermions and the scalars, let's see how they interact. And this is the same thing. Now we have photons, we should make them interact. After all, only interacting theory is interesting. If it's a free theory, we know what we do, what the particles do, they just follow the geodesic. Okay, so, but we have seen the interaction between light and matter already. We have write, written down the Lagrange. Yeah, we did. So, quantum electrodynamics. So, what we did is that, uh, remember what we say is that, hey, we spotted this cute bilinear says, huh, what kind of terms can we write down? Well, this bilinear, gamma mu themselves are just numbers, but this bilinear actually transforms with vac as a vector, so it makes sense to write to 
give it another vector. And then this term would be Lorentz invariant, hence should be allowed. And this is indeed allowed. This is the quantum electrodynamics. This is the interaction between fermions and photons. Yeah? And then, then we're like, oops. The amu has this gate symmetry, and this term doesn't look at all that to respect the gauge symmetry at all. And then we realize, don't worry, if the Poisson also transform maybe together the full Lagrangian will you do something, then the gauge symmetry would be respect. Yeah? Remember that a little not very long derivation? Is that we claim that uh, this guy transform with a divergence, and this guy transform as a e minus alpha e minus q alpha of x, and then it will work, and it fix the coupling constant, like. This term can only show up in the Lagrangian in a very certain way. Otherwise, this, symmetry, this gauge symmetry wouldn't respect. And we realize we can use a fun trick. So if we define the covariant deriv derivative is equals to this guy, then writing down interaction is very simple. You just replace the partial derivative with the covariant derivative. And of course, we should write the free Maxwell theory Lagrange. So this is known as QED Lagrange. Yeah, you have seen this already. I'm just, we should always have the free theory over there. And now what's left to do is to read off the Feynman rules. Well, I don't fancy to go through all the LSC reduction formula again, but if you do, I can find some references. So, well, we can profit, right? Because this is, in our mind, just for klein gordon theory. Okay, so let's first look at the vertex Feynman rule. Vertex Feynman rule normally is simple. You just look at the interact, interacting Lagrangian and then you put an I in front. Let's say what a kind of thing we have now. Let's only look at the interaction. The interaction is given by Psi bar and I, and there is also IQ A mu. And then, I shouldn't forget that the gamma mu is hidden in a slash, and now there is another percent. So the only thing I did is I plug d mu into this and I read it off. And I throw the free Lagrangian away because we already derived their ephemerals. So, well, there is minus q, psi bar, a mu, Gamma mu So in the Feynman rule language, they say there is a fermion and then there is a photon. Photon is always represented by these lines. It's only when you learn about gluons that I become very confused which, photon, which is photon, which is gluon. They all look wavy, but they wave in a different Okay, so. Our task is to find this vertex. And um, the recipe is put an eye in front of that thing. So I think it shouldn't surprise you that much. I will write minus IQ. The question is, is that it? So let's think about it about the Feynman rules. When, when we were try, whenever we are trying to read off Feynman rules, we always think about what actually LSC accomplished for us. 
in one word, in one sentence, L, what LSC accomplished for us is that the scattering amplitude is some time ordered field operators vacuum expectation with a bunch of operator acting on it, right? So the idea is that our way of calculating the amplitude is try to utilize the fact if I just have a time ordered field operators, a bunch of them, eventually you can just use weak theorems and I'll contract them away and use propagators. It's all propagators, which means we can only throw the field in. Anything that is not a field sticking between them, we should take them out. They should belong to the expansion coefficient of the Taylor expansion. So this is the only tricky part about a QED, is your Feynman rule actually come with a gamma matrix, which makes sense. Think about that a photon, it, it does carry an index. So we're gonna derive scalar QED. I heard that David also promised you guys something says, can we talk about a scalar QED? Okay, we're gonna do this little exercise by finding the interaction through interaction Lagrangian and the read off the vertex in the afternoon too for scalar QED. But this is the only tricky part is that the only thing you want to be left, which get sandwiches in those vacuum state, is other field operator. And if it's anything else, it goes to the rule. So this will be like important again in QFT2 when you learn more complicated theories. Well, it's, it works all the same, except it become more complicated. But that's the rule, that's because that's how we derive it. We only want field operators in our expectation value. So, well, that wasn't hard. So let's take a look at, briefly take a look at what happens. I'll just be lazy and take half of it. Say, this guy, is given by u, which depends on p, and has this index, and then it come with a operator, and then has this in index, and then it is that. And then we compare this, with the a mu minus, which is epsilon has come with mu, and there are four of them. So then it comes with a quantization where there's also four of them, and it depends on p. This typically depends on p. And then, so I'm just comparing these things and realize how do I, so let's just try to think about it, where is the external line rule come from? The external line rule come from something like finding some integral of operators and then what is you get some Dirac operator, but who cares? They, they all get canceled. What's important is what is left. Like when you read all Feynman rules from a mode expansion, what is important is actually not the Dirac operator because that's what you expect. And it's what's left that's important. That's why that the scalar field has external leg one because there's nothing left. So which means, I hope it's not a surprising that if I say there is a photon and the coming in to this vertex, the, the Feynman rule will just be 
the whatever is in front. And because if I use lambda and I have to, so it is the, uh, normally just marked as it's the incoming photon polarization. It's a notation that it's clear because photon, unlike fermions, they don't have arrows on them. And then, so now if we have a photon coming out of the vertex, it's just the outgoing photon's polarization. It's just whatever is in front. Because these polarization vectors, they are just a bunch of real numbers. Even if you dagger this, it's, it's a real field, so there's no complication. And then we're just using in and out to point it out. It's whatever the external states that provide us. Shouldn't there be a transpose? Because... Ah, that's probably true. Yeah, I think that a transpose is just big. So because this is just one of them and it's a four vector, it's just when you write down like a, like a P mu, P mu, you don't write the transpose anymore. It's just two four vectors. So you, you, the, the transpose is denoted by where the mu is. Because the mu is upper than it's transpose. You need a column and a row, right? Made the multiple in fine. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, you're, pro you're probably right. I, I, I'm not thinking. I'm just wondering why the polarization should be real. Um, it's like in the condition we have. We have. What do we have is this condition. That's the only condition we have on these four four vectors. And uh, remember, we can choose a special frame, and you can choose a special set of polarization vector, which is just one, zero, 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 one. Okay, so it's just that, but, that, but then you, you, do, you, you, to get the general one, you just do Lorentz transformation on them. And the Lorentz transformation oh. wouldn't introduce complex. Everybody happy? If everybody is happy, then I can continue writing down all the Feynman rules we have seen so far. Well, not the scalar ones. The scalar ones has a bunch of one, and then it depends on the interaction term. So, <laughs> okay. So, we will forget about a scalar for in the morning. In the afternoon, they will come back into the story. Now we're just going to review all the Feynman rules in fermion theory. Because I'm going to ask you guys to draw Feynman diagrams and write down matrix element. And it would be nice if the rules are just on the board, you can just look. And of course, if when you look and you, that there are thoughts in your head to ask where they come from, that's also nice. But the, let's do this thing. So there is a vertex. And there's a fermion coming in. So that tells us it's a fermion. This tells me it's coming in. And then this is given by incoming fermion is given by some polarization that a spin label that I don't know, it would depend on the three momentum vector. <sighs> yeah, it's all the rules we derived together. I'm just putting on the board so that uh, 
that there is a reference. OK, you might get bored of seeing me writing all the rules that we derived. So now you can practice interview by thinking about the popular question I would ask is why the incoming fermion is u and the incoming anti-fermion is v bar. And I'll continue murmuring about uh, the Freyfeimer root. So here is, say I would ask why this one comes with bar. And now there is an outgoing fermion. Here's a small arrow for momentum. And this one is u bar. And of course, you can write a one for anti fermion. So those are the external leg rule, while well, the interaction rule, the vertex rule is here. This is the vertex rule we're going to use today. And then there are some minus signs, says that if one diagram switch odd number of labels on external fermion legs and then look like another a minus sign popping out. And we know this minus sign, they are originally coming from the weak contraction. That you have the swept things. So minus signs, as you have all, I think uh, most of you guys submit the homework, they all are originally from the anti-commutator. And some of them go a little bit more detail, but um, then it's basically there's commutator, so normal auditing, there's minus sign, time ordering, there's minus sign. Weak contraction, the, the thing we do is basically exchange things in the time ordering, so more minus sign. And then we find that there is actually a final rule for it. it says indeed that you can recover minus signs just by staring at the Feynman diagram. It's not in, so enlightening why this is faster than do, doing weak, inter, weak contraction, but you do have, you know, one loop, two loops, many loops. So, and then this result is important, is that if there is a fermion loop, there is a minus sign. It's not a tricky thing. If you just draw a fermion rule, and then you write down fermion loop, you write down the fermion propagator, yeah. This minus sign, is, so this is in reference to another diagram, right? Right. So relative. Pick one to be positive, basically. Yeah, it doesn't matter what you we do. You just have to pick one, and if there is many, then you all respect to that guy. Because overall, you're going to do square it. So overall minus sign doesn't matter. Just pick one, and the relative minus sign do matter because we can actually measure. Okay, so this should be all the Feynman rules. Well, I'm preparing for the next part of you. You can always stop me and tell me that I forget something. I hope I didn't. Oh, where's the propagator? Oh, they did. What? Oh, here's the propagator, but I didn't draw one. Here. And there's a mild index here, U index. All right. Oh, fermion propagator. <coughs> Apparently, I threw away all the propagator for some reason. This is not a good. So this time, I could even write it nicely, says 
they actually come with an index too, just like the photon propagator. It's just we always subtract the, the fermion propagator. But if I keep it around in momentum space, it will give you give us this. Yeah. Who A B? Because that is slash carries. Which makes sense. If you have any field that has more than one component, go to any other field has one more the same component. The only propagator we're calculating is from one specific component to the other specific component. Are we ready? Oh, I'm I'm not ready. Which bag? I have many bags. Okay, so now I kindly ask you to yes. So the propagator doesn't distinguish between whether it's a fermion or an anti-fermion? Yes, it does. So it should have an error on it. But, and then when you follow the five fermion line inversely, I don't, you just write this. Yeah, you are very correct. This arrow is important. Like, no, no, that's a very, very important things you draw your Feynman you draw your Feynman diagram, the arrow should be always pointing to one direction and become a line that has arrows and then no flipped arrows. Yeah. So um, why isn't there an I epsilon? I the mass I Ah yeah 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 to be very correct I should write this. In the denominator though is there Oh yeah yeah there should be the I epsilon. Sorry, it's just when, I, when you calculate the matrix element of square, that the epsilon never really matters in calculation. It's just really good for, to understand how to draw the counter and have it. But yes, of course it is. Any more questions? If you don't have more questions, can you move close to each other in some fashion such that the three of you guys form a loop. No. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, at least make some agreement. <laughs> make some agreement such that the three... Oh, they don't know, I think we exactly have... Uh, yeah, there is three, there is... Can the... The person, <laughs> Honam, can you move forward? I think there were two people here. So now we have, ah, oh, we have exactly mod three equals zero. <laughs> this, this is non-trivial. I only get this 33% time, right? <laughs> yeah, no, you have blank paper. So can you just put pass, the, pass the blank paper around? <laughs> And I have more things to pass around. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Well, I think you would like to do this part. Look, look what I have. <laughs> anyway, just pass them around. And also each, I guess each person can get the one. And I'll do the other part. So, unfortunately, your tutorial is not blank. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. You could hope so. No. Okay. I'm just going to write things on board while explaining what's going on. I should label them. Uh, at least we have another one. So, what are we going to do is a process, so wait, I'll first propose the alternative thing. So I hope then, I hope you will like this a little bit better. So the alternative thing 
is that I will write down all the process, draw all the Feynman diagram, write down all the matrix element on the board, and make a bunch of mistakes. <laughs> and somehow I feel that you might get bored to death if I do that. But if you want to watch me do it, I can hopefully do it. But it's much better for you guys to do it. So there are some specific instructions to follow. Is that first, so the idea is that uh, so every person will do three things. Every person, that's equivalent. That, but the, the step one is to roll a die. <laughs> to determine a dice, right? Die? Dice. 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 OK, roll a dice and determine which one is your process. And also, I need a blank paper. I don't have blank paper. Where is blank paper? Oh, shit. Can you have, what, where is the leftover blank paper? Oh, can I get one of you give me a blank paper? <laughs> no, no, no. You, each of you will need one. So it's not step two. Write your process on the, the number of your process, like on this crease. I just learned the word yesterday. So write this crease and, the, and the fold it so that Nobody except yourself knows about this process. Yeah? Yeah? Everybody is on step two. <laughs> That's all I need. OK. And you should know your process. No, you cannot roll the diet. <laughs> You shouldn't change the die roll decision. Just roll a die, and that's your process. And step three is to draw the Feynman diagram. And then the next step is to hide your diagram. No, no, no. Shush. Show your diagram and pass to one direction or two independent direction. I don't care. Pass to the left or right. Agree upon the group. But after you agree, you should put pass on the same direction. Agree a direction and pass it. And then the next step would be the person would be looking at the diagram. Pick one diagram because normally there are more than one. Pick one and then write down the amplitude. You, so the, the person should be only looking at the Feynman diagram, but not knowing what's the process. But regardless, should they write down the amplitude, and then you pass again. And the seventh step is the best. You should guess the process. And then when we pass again, it should be back to yourself, and then you should check if they guess right. So every step, well, you could make a very interesting amount of mistakes such that somehow it still get back. But of course, the idea is that uh, you would only get the process back if everybody did it right. OK? After which order? Uh, yeah. What do you mean after? You know, I mean, two vertices, one million vertices. How many loops? I don't know. Tree level. <laughs> Tree level. We will have fun with loops this afternoon. Some fun. Until that it's not fun anymore, then we don't draw them. Tree level. Tree level. So, 
I, I hope that the people have more experience with drawing QED diagram and writing down their matrix elements. And we'll take a five minute break. And uh, of course, you're welcome to continue discussing about uh, how to write down QED matrix element. And uh, at the 10, we will figure out now that I have the matrix element, how do I actually find something that I can give to an experimentalist? So the last step, connecting the matrix element to the cross section. So at the 10, now you can, well, it's the five minute break, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> and I see people's enthusiasm about cross sections. <laughs> Coffee? Cross sections. Hmm. Okay, no. It's, it's not, it's their choice. Okay, so as I said before the break, that now we're going to make the, the final step towards the cross section, which I say people are not enthusiastic about it, but that is the thing we can show experimentalists and they can actually compute. They, 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 they can do the experiment to check if a theory is correct or not. So it's very important. Otherwise, we can just write down random interaction like and, uh, and don't know if it's, they are there or not. So, How do we get a cross section? There is a lot of uh, something called phase space integration, blah, blah. But the most important thing is this matrix square thing. So remember in bosonic theory, well, that's not too hard because you have a function. Now you might have more than one function. You just add them up and square it. And, uh, okay, let's try to make this more enthusiastic that your homework is calculated one of this for, for this process. Okay, so I'll, it's, I'll just point out a couple pit trap that you might fall in when calculate this. So I'll, demonstrate how to calculate one of them. And you were like, why don't you just calculate this? Nope, that's not what I'm gonna do. Instead, I'll make the life more interesting by introducing another fermion. So we have some QED Lagrange. Let's see, we could, why not? It's around being observed. It's actually very important that you, in all kinds of experiment, is that inter, they, they, they look at the muons. It's just, muon is just like electron except it's heavier. Because it's heavier, it decay to electron. But if you look at the cosmic ray, lots of them, because you know relativity thing, time gets uh, slower, so they don't decay immediately. So this thing definitely exists, observe. And, uh, and we should do this. That's exactly what we're gonna do in the tutorial is, we learned different aspects of theory. We isolate the different interaction, there's some, some scalar field, they self-interact a lot, and then they interact with, fer with fermions through this Yukawa, then they interact in the QED way, QED talk about the fermions and uh, elect the, the photons. But in principle, the reality is that they are all there. 
You write down the Lagrangian. If you look at the standard model, model Lagrangian, which in some way you can fit on the T-shirt, there are many terms. What we did was very, you know, toy model-ish. We're like, let's just look at this term. So this process in real life will occur. And the reason I'm doing it is, of course, that I'll just draw the Feynman diagram with some photons, with some other fermions, and there's E. And then there is this. Mu minus is a real fermion. This one is not a fermion. So the reason I'm doing this is there is only one diagram. And a hint, the one that you are going to do for the homework, for the final homework, there are two diagrams. So you will actually experience the idea of interference between two diagrams. But you know, you square like A plus B, you get the three terms. This term is done today. In your homework, you literally can just can say that uh, this term is done, this is the result, but you have to calculate the other. Well, you have, uh, yes. There's yeah. no interaction between the Dirac field and the, and the Muon field? Or is there? I mean, because. Well, yeah, there is, but it's not a QED. So you, if you go further down the standard model path, there is. But there's. Mm, no way you can smash this and this together in QED. There is some thing called the lepton number. So only weak interaction will change which type of fermion you are. So that's why I want to do this calculation, because that tells me that I only need to do one term. But the doing more than one term is not hard. So, so now I have to write down the matrix element. So let me pick this mu on line and follow it in the opposite direction. I see a mu on, which is u bar s1. I'll skip the, well, I'll not skip the moment. And then the next thing I see is a vertex. So I write down minus i q gamma mu. And then I see the outgoing anti fermion. So it's actually less tricky than that. You're like, Anti-fermion, and then I have to make it uh, Lorentz invariant. So you know, anti-fermion is V, and uh, bars contracted with number. So you only need to figure out one half. And the other half, you just look at it, what a kind of fermion it is. So this shouldn't be terribly different from what you have if you have the electrons and the positron. So, I'll just actually write down the uh, belong to the mu. And then I encounter a photon propagator. So that's minus i e eta mu nu p square. I'll figure out what's p later. And then there is another line that if I follow inversely, I say a positron, so it better be V, and it better be a bar, because that's my starting of a, another Lorentz invariant thing. So there's some S3. I guess I'm picking the momentum as, momentum as I go. That might not be the best idea. Okay, no label means electron, label means muon. I guess what I picked is P1, P2, P3, P4. Okay, 
I strongly suggest you guys pick the momentum before start writing down the matrix element. <laughs> this is not a good habit. Sorry. Okay, so we have this giant thing. And P, well, since I'm having the incoming particles, incoming things being together, so I'll replace it by this guy. Yeah. Now we want to square this. It doesn't sound fine, is it? But unfortunately, this is a required scale for people who have taken QFT1. Actually, sometimes it's a lot earlier, the scale training. Okay, so the calculation, so what I can do now is uh, square this dude. Okay, let's take out the interaction. This part is easy, they're just by, so there's another i. But the i does, doesn't matter that much, you're gonna square. Okay, so there's a bunch of i's because I have only one term. I'm totally not caring what happens to that bunch of i's. I'm doing a modular square thing. What I care is there's a q square, now it'll become a q to the fourth. And then downstairs, there is some kinetic term. Yeah? So this is something not hard. I'm just squaring things. And what becomes compl complicated is when we square this guy. So, so it's clear that is the, there is an eta here, so this gamma mu is just going to contract with this gamma. That's also clear. What's unclear, and what is I'm doing here, is trying to figure out what happened to this thing. The index, okay, I'll, I'll keep it down. The mu, mu, four. Okay. How do I square this? Well, actually we do the Euro thing. We find the, the complex conjugate of this thing. So this thing, since I'm only finding the conscious complex conjugate, I'll just strip off all these decorations and I can put them back because the four is apparently go with U, the three is go with V bar. I'm just saying, what is this? And this, you actually know what it is. Because I know what the U dagger is. I know what the gamma mu dagger is. Oh, it's a distance past, but you definitely apply to this trick a few times. And what th that's bar. Bar means there is a gamma zero, but a gamma zero dagger is just gamma zero. Then now we have the V dagger, after dagger, it'll be V. Yeah. Um, we're gonna like sum over the spinner indices at some point. Don't we want to do that before taking the magnitude, or does it not matter? We will. Okay. We will. At this point, uh, I, I'm not obliged to yet. It will come up soon, very soon. So spinner index is summarized, summed. See, this is A. There is A B. And there's B. Oh, I, okay. So I'm it's the, the, those those it will come up in like four minutes, something. Uh, are are you using these switched for muons or am I seeing things? I, I'm taking this guy. Sorry, they are. I, I I'm doing for this. Regardless of what you're doing right now. Are, yeah. Because if we follow the fermion line. Yeah. For muons, we start with the anti muon, right? No, that's the muon. Oh, we follow you up. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, it's okay. I mean, this is the first day you do it. It is. Okay. So, then you realize 
Aha! Isn't this nice? He just literally flipped and the bar and the not a bar just followed at the right place. Questions? Uh, I think we're a little confused, like why you would just take this half separately. Ah, okay. So let's restore this these spinner index. Sorry, writing the wrong one is not going to help me. So this is like a not a matrix. So this part alone is not a matrix. This part alone is not a matrix. But what about the space time index? Uh -huh. What about the space time index? Isn't that still a problem? Oh. You mean the mu and new? Yeah, OK. You have a good point. Well, we'll just have to figure out how that works. So, uh oh, I shouldn't do that. So, if now we forget about the spinner index, we'll get another copy of another copy of that. So, okay, you, you're right. This index might not be right. So, how about we do this? Let's first look at what happens to squaring this guy. So, so remember the spinner index and the space-time index are completely separate things. So I'm going to treat them separately. And the only thing carry the space-time index is this thing. And if I want to square this, I just get another copy of it. So basically what I'm saying is that this thing itself is gamma mu, gamma mu. And then the, another copy will be gamma rho, gamma rho. Well, the reason I'm not a square the entire thing is because it's too long to write. So basically what I'm saying is that uh, when I square this, I, I basically get a gamma matrix with a different index which will be contracted with the different, the, the different index produced by squaring this. Okay, maybe it's the best if I strip off all the other things and just write down V bar, gamma, V bar three. See, it's hard to, it's hard to carry all those things around. Then let's just remember, they do have momentum dependence. They do have a spin label. So let's do it properly. So there is U bar 1, U bar 1, gamma mu, V2. And then there is a V bar 3, gamma mu, U4. All right. So all the momentum dependence and the spin labels have been stripped so that we can keep track both the contraction in the spinner index and the contraction in the gammas. Yeah? Fair enough? So if I square this thing, but now I know how to do it. This says if you, well, I guess the first term doesn't change. This is just given by this. But when we square it, because it's taking the dagger, so we actually go backwards. 
So this is going to give me u4 bar gamma v, v bar gamma u. And the gamma acquires some new, new index rows. Uh, v's in the middle are three and two, I assume? Right. I should, of course, keep their index. Otherwise, I'll never be able to go back. OK. So I guess we should pause here, because this is confusing <laughs> and important. So what we did is we say, OK, write this thing square is going to be really hard. Let's look at it first. What we observe is this thing is a spinner. In spinner space, it's like it doesn't transform. This thing doesn't transform in spinner indices. But on the other hand, if you look at all the gamma and the eta, it doesn't have sp all the space-time indexes are contracted too. But of course, we are calculating a Lorentz scalar. So of course, it should be that in spinner indices and in space-time indices that they are all Lorentz scalar. So what did we do? The next step is figuring out how do I square something is a spinner scalar. It has all contracted a spinner, all, so all the spinner indices contracted a thing without thinking too hard about the gamma yet. And then they realized it does very nicely. It switched the position, and because we need still to be spinner scalar, then the the bar just naturally occur where it should. Then we realize, OK, but we do have to worry about the space-time indices. So let's just throw away all the momentum and the spinner in the spin label, those polarization, and write that amplitude very compactly here. Then we just follow what we just discovered by inverting this whole thing. Yeah, now I just have this thing to worry about. We're good to go? Yeah? OK. Now, what do we do is to restore this indexes. Well, new cycle. Yeah. So this is some indices. And we have some momentum dependence, which are hidden. I'll just write this guy up. And there is the, right? So this thing, this thing, I don't know how much I can teach you by squaring this again for you. You just have to square once by yourself. It's just this whole thing. You strip off all the indices, and then you write a thing that is reverse. It's really just writing the same thing in reverse order. And where it has to be barred, you bar it. Actually, it is reversed. You write it in the reverse order. If there is no bar now, it has bar, there's bar, there's no bar. Yeah? Uh, do, we, yeah. do we consider that the particles, the initial and the, and the final? Very good, yeah. right. This is what I'm going to talk about right now. Oh, okay. Yes. People all worry about these spin labels. Indeed, we should worry. Because. Now, if, if we know, so now they are not summed yet. But as I mentioned two days ago, or one day ago, well, in the experimentally, it's very hard to prepare all electrons line up, spin up. 
And it's also really hard to whatever come out of the collider. Like it, it's already pretty hard to give a tag to the particle. Ah, I found this muon. And it's really, really hard to so say this muon actually is spinning in some direction. So what we do, customarily do, is not calculate this. But then instead we skid stick effect of one quarter says we're going to sum all the spin labels ever show up and then divide it by averaging because this has two choices. So that's one, a half and there's another half. And they were like, yay, now we are summing all the spin labels. So, so because alternative choice, if somebody really doing an experiment with all the things measured, there's nothing we can do about this term, but now it does. Look at this term, nicely turn into a spin sum. Isn't that wonderful? And so, so this, you know how to do. This thing turns into P slash plus M. And then you have another pair. They have another pair. So you just turn them all into this P slash plus M, P slash minus M, blah, blah, blah. And the only, the only thing you want to notice is since now all the spin that has been restored, if you put this here, this produces another one. Then if you keep track of your index, you realize it's a cycle. So it's like HA will give you something like a P1 slash plus M. And then you will have a gamma. Then you will have some other slash minus M, blah, 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 another gamma, another one of this. But then it is a trace because all your indexes form a cycle. And this is really how much I want to say because you can open any book to check all the gamma traces, trace identities. They are not hard to prove. And we only really need two because the homework stated very clearly says we're doing high energy collision, take the electron to be massless. So a lot of terms drop out. The only thing you need to calculate is like a P slash, P slash. There is, so, so this become, I think it's becoming two traces. So there is one here, then there is the end, and then it starts again. So they, they become two traces, which you can just use trace identity. It's in any book, it's in, it's in the lecture notes. Then in the lecture notes, I'll follow this thing through. You have a very thorough example how this happens. That uh, how the traces is calculated, you have, like it looks very dizzy, but there's nothing tricky anymore. That these, those are just algebra, you have to do it once in your life. So if you look at lecture notes, you can follow through all the rest. And this is just two things I want to point it out, how to do a dagger of this, how this thing actually turned into a trace. But after that, it's just algebra. So I'll end the class here, but I want to advertise to QFT2. So I'll try to briefly tell you what's going to happen in the next course. In the first week, we'll learn the past integral formulation of the quantization, especially when you encounter fermions, there's going to have Grassmann variables. They, those are fun. They are just number, but they, they are somehow anti-commute. Well, the anti-commute has to show up any, somewhere. And the second week, roughly, we'll learn the dark magic of the renormalization. <laughs> Remember all those infinities that we have sweep underneath the carpet. Now we're going to try to justify it. You, you might still be not convinced, but we'll try to justify it. And uh, in the third week, uh, we're going to learn even more forces. We learned about the electric magnetic force, and we'll learn the non-abelian gauge theory, which accounts for the other forces in our life. Well, not a gravity, but you know, I always wonder if the force is described by a gauge theory. But then I wouldn't know what's the force carrier. 
But I guess that's Jai there. Okay, I'll end here.